Hey guys, what's up? It is week 316. I got a bunch of reviews for you. No update, because a bunch of stuff didn't come, but next update, I should have a slew of things. Hopefully that vinegar syndrome order comes in. We had the halfway to Black Friday sale. It's uh, the day I'm recording it that Friday. So yeah, let's hop into the reviews, and boom. First one up is from MVD Rewind, and this is uh, David Pryor flick. You guys know David Pryor. He did Deadly uh, Prey, and he also did Sledgehammer, the 1982-83 SOV kind of movie. And uh, this is Killzone. This one's made in 1985. It stars Ted Pryor um, and Fritz Matthews. Now, Ted Pryor is obviously David Pryor's brother. Uh, I think Ted Pryor's still alive. David Pryor has since passed. They also did Killer Workout, uh, which is a really fun movie. So, yeah, I'm happy to see this one hit Blu-ray. So, uh, this one, I, I, you know, it had a kind of a small life on VHS, maybe a cult item. Didn't really have a DVD release that I know of, but uh, this one's pretty interesting. And uh, I, I just want to say before I get into it, because, you know, if you don't watch the trailer or don't read the back, there is kind of like a reveal that is really cool in the movie. And uh, before I say anything about that reveal, I want to say I enjoyed it. It's kind of a fun, low-budget uh, action kind of flick that's a little bit better than expected on a high body count. But so we get into this movie. So essentially what we have here is you think it's kind of like this really kind of cheap Vietnam movie. You know, uh, there, there's a slew of Vietnam movies made in the 80s and stuff. I just covered one here a while back, uh, Dog Tags, which is really good, actually by the director of Nightmares in a Damaged Brain. So I'm, I'm watching this and I'm like, okay, we got Ted, uh, you know, David Pryor's Vietnam flick. And, you know, Deadly Prey probably shares a lot of similarities to this kind of being hunted kind of guy thing. So what happens is we have a group of POWs and they're being tortured in what we think is Vietnam. And they're being beat. And one guy's starting to crack under the pressure. He's starting to lose his grip on reality. Um, and there is a commanding officer who's very aggressive. And he seems to be a traitor. Like he was uh, allied of, uh, you know, a United States soldier. And he's working with the Viet Cong. All this kind of deal. And then about 30 minutes into it, we reveal that this is a major training exercise. And the colonel has kind of lost, gone a little too far. And this character has completely lost his mind. He He's no longer, he's having flashbacks to his family, flashbacks to Vietnam. And at one point, he completely snaps from the entire ordeal. And he ends up kind of, uh, you know, killing a couple people. And this turns it into kind of like the hard target, you know, deadly, uh, what's the one, dangerous, dangerous, oh, fuck, why can't I think of the classic novel where they hunt the guy? Naked Prey was the movie version of it, that kind of deal. So that's basically deadliest prey or something. We have that deal. And they're hunting him, but uh, Ted Pryor, being his friend and having no loyalty to him, we see what happened in a flashback, decides to try to help him out. But, uh, you know, it doesn't go as planned. Uh, what the movie does do pretty well is it establishes a lot of these kind of soldier characters, a handful of them well. Like, you know, they're goons and they're in the background. They have their own moments. The colonel's a real son of a bitch. There's points when he's just losing his mind on Matthews and, and Pryor. And he's just like, I swear. And you're just like, what is happening here? It's absolutely hilarious. Um, he's a little over the top, but it, it fits with the movie. And a big chunk of the movie is like booby traps and people getting killed and, and martial arts stuff. Overall, it's a pretty solid movie. And that turn, like, and like 40 minutes into it, you're like, oh shit, this isn't just a cheap looking uh, Vietnam movie. There's a reason why the barbed wire cages look like they're about to fall over because it's a training exercise. But no, I thought this was pretty interesting. I thought the acting range, you know, it's, it's fine. It's a, it's fine for a low budget directed video movie. But uh, what we have here, as far as the special features are concerned, um, we have scanned and restored in 4K. That's very cool from the 35 uh, millimeter inner positive. And then we also have new audio commentary plus audio video commentary with producer and co-writer Jack Marino moderated by Serial at Midnight host Heath Holland. You guys know him. He has a, a um, YouTube show, does a bunch of stuff. And then we have new Making of Kill Zone, featuring an interview with co-writer and producer Jack Marino, moderated by filmmaker and project producer Steve Ladshaw. Now, Steve Ladshaw has done a bunch of movies, including Jacko, uh, Vampire Trailer Park. Um, didn't he do like the Biohazard remake or something? And I can't think of the title for that one. But Steve Ladshaw is an independent filmmaker as well. And he he talks to Moreno and they talk about the history of the movie. He talks about the VHS kind of love for this one, how it's a cold item. And they're kind of excited to re-put it out. That's also very nice. And we also hear kind of like the history of this movie, who owned the rights. We talk about, you know, Shapiro and Glickenhaus and all those guys. You know, their movies that they made like Exterminator and all that kind of shit. So that was very interesting to, to hear all the information as well and you know why it's a little harder sometimes to put something out than people think why isn't this out oh it's so but there's reasons for it you know 
Um, then we also have the new making of Killzone featuring an inter I already got that, sorry. And then uh, Killzone Vestron video version. Um, photo gallery original theatrical trailer. So if this sounds like it's up your alley, you could do a lot worse. Um, I enjoyed myself. High kill count. Uh, good goons that you want to see get killed. Yeah, and a lot of booby traps. Okay, the next one up is from Radiance Films, and this is Red Sun, not to be confused with the 1971 movie with Charles Bronson and uh, uh, who is it? Toshiro Mifune. Uh, this is a completely different beast. This is a German film, like I said, from 1970, and I actually covered 1970, did a lot of horror films and some thrillers, um, and Red Sun wasn't on my radar, and honestly, this is more horror than a lot of the movies I did watch. I mean, um, but so yeah, this one is is pretty interesting movie. Now, I do, I don't love a lot of early German cinema and French cinema, a certain period I love some French cinema right don't get me wrong um, but a lot of anything that leans in the exploitation kind of world and from Germany and France is very iffy for me I never know what I'm gonna get and this movie is exploitative exploitation in a, in a way but I also see a lot of artistic merit behind it and a lot of exploitation movies do have that so I, I don't want to kind of say that but there is like an artistic obviously message in this film and it, and it is interesting so we kind of follow these four women that live in this apartment and um, one of them kind of picks up this Daryl, like kind of drifter. He's just kind of almost like, I guess you'd say degenerate. He just doesn't have, seem to have money. He just, he looks kind of like a, a weird mixture of early Malcolm McDowell from Clockwork Orange and Mick Jagger, but obviously not as good looking as those guys. But uh, so, so he ends up kind of like going in this bar and meeting this girl and she kind of starts to have a liking for him and brings him around. Um, but you know, something's rotten in Denmark right away because there's a guy tied up in the next room that he was at the bar as well. And they're arguing amongst each other and saying things like, well, you should, all this kind of stuff that just leaves these hints out. Uh, and then we kind of fast forward, we see what they're doing. They're definitely killing men. Uh, we, we get more backstory as it goes on. And it's kind of like a, a clock here. They have a certain amount of time that he has, um, you know, to live. And, and you're kind of wondering the entire time, is she going to kill him? Is there going to be a power struggle between these women? Um, there's some really good moments, you know, a guy approaching this guy and talking to him about the entire situation and him staying and just kind of the relationship of, you know, how horrible men can be to women and women eventually getting revenge. Now it's light in, in the terms, if you compare it to something like a gun for Jennifer and then that terms, that's just all out balls out, you know, dead men don't rape kind of deal um, or Miss 45, but this could be a precursor and it is more of an interesting thing. It reminds me of the movie from the seventies called the females. If I'm not mistaken, that was what it was called. And that's the one where they were kind of cannibals and they were kind of bringing in men and eating them, which I thought was an interesting kind of, you know, I guess parallel to this or whatever. I thought that was pretty cool. But no, this movie is an interesting movie. And being German, I, um, I I didn't really know exactly what to expect from this time because, like I said, some of the exploitation movies from that time seemed to be a little held back or a little tame or just a little sloppy. This one I thought was really well done, well acted um, for the most part. And everybody was, you know, looked solid in it and uh, had great, I mean, it's a great look looking movie too, to be honest, from the time. So, I mean, seeing all the fashion and everything like that. Uh, the only complaint, the only knock on the movie is at the very end, um, a lot of the fight choreographing and like the shootouts and stuff were always really piss poor. Uh, I've seen some really bad kind of exploitation movies from this time from Germany and France that just have some of the absolute worst fight choreographing or um, I, I don't know I'm lumping in France there too but like in this terms of like there's just nobody doing these fights or nobody doing these shoots like the shootouts and everything like that they're almost not existently done and very you know I, I don't want to say matter of fact matter of crap is what I would say they're just really poorly done I don't need squibs or anything it's just they don't they're not very effective but besides that the rest of the movie is really solid and really interesting as far as special features are concerned there's a couple video essays on here which I really like one kind of goes over the history and, and kind of like the transgressive German cinema if I'm not mistaken oh yeah the uh, Margaret Diaz tracing the development of the new German cinema that's interesting and there's an entirely new um, uh, one on here video essay by scholar uh, Johannes von Mucki on social and cultural influences on film now yeah. so these are those are really interesting stuff i love the video essays because they talk about tons of movies and you get a brief history of the subgenre and the history of film it's a lot to take in though but a lot of the movies you will recognize you've heard about so you're like oh that's that's pretty neat but uh red sun this is good stuff there's also a nice booklet in here uh i think with essays by sam deegan um it has some really beautiful locations too and when they do show nudity although there's like sexual aspects a lot of the nudity is just like matter of fact which i thought that was refreshing as well in a movie like this you would expect more and they give you you know very naturalistic nudity so that's cool red sun 
Okay, the next one here is The Sound of Summer from On Earth Films, and this is a pretty interesting one. Now, this is directed by Sculpt Mending Fragments. Um, he was a YouTuber at one point, and he's a filmmaker. Um, he did the one Difficulty Breathing and a Rope Maiden, or two kind of like shorts. Um, they're a little longer than short shorts, but, you know, not exactly feature-length movies, and this is a feature-length here. And he resides in Japan, so he made this film from Japan as, a, as a, I guess, a foreigner living there. That's pretty interesting stuff. You don't typically see that. I know that there was a Giallo, I think, made in Italy by an American or British director, which I thought was interesting back in the day. Um, I think it's Girl in Room 2A. But so, so saying that, maybe that was a rumor that it was originally an American director. But anyways, The Sound of Summer. So I, I love the idea here. I, I've often thought that cicadas would make a great backdrop for a horror film because they're so bizarre the way they come in every like certain amount of years and they have that, that cry, you know, the cry of the cicada, which was actually what I wanted to name my Giallo if I ever made it, the cry of the cicada um because the animal in the title not you know, not but no just the idea i was like oh that's, that's a really cool idea and then i saw blood hook and i was like oh i guess that's kind of similar to what i might have had some ideas about and sound of summer is too but not really uh sound of summer is a super bizarre and interesting film in the aspect that it feels a lot like those like direct to video japanese movies from the like mid 80s all the way to the 90s 2000s kind of deals where you see like uh, i don't want to say gozu the forsaken thing by god or like a guinea pig movie but it has some of the same flavor to be honest so we have this girl who starts to kind of um there's a she works in a coffee shop i believe and this kind of strange guy comes in and he's been like capturing the cicadas and putting them in containers and he's all dressed up he's all sweaty he's got his face covered up and he's just a bizarre character, and right away, her and her friend kind of laugh at him, kind of say, what's this guy's deal, yada, 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 etc. And after that, she starts to kind of, like, hear the cicadas increasingly louder and louder and louder until it turns into some sort of nightmarish world where her body is starting to, like, be affected by the cicadas, where she thinks there's larvae in her. She thinks it's the cicada man. And she's seeing a psychiatrist or a doctor, and she's obviously losing her grip on reality. And by the end climax, we start to get some strange visuals and this mixture of reality and fantasy and past lives and all this kind of weird stuff. And you can put together what you think possibly happened, if there's a correlate, if there's a, a if there's you know a direct connection between all these characters in the past, or they're just basically you know vessels for what he had happened to him. All this kind of strange stuff. There's definitely some extreme body horror and the morphing and changing of someone's physical appearance which I thought was cool. The self-mutilation that comes with the body horror at times, that's in here as well. I mean, it is graphic in a lot of ways, but it's not the most graphic thing you've ever seen. I mean, they put out body horror that's pretty graphic. Thanamorphous or whatever that one is from on Earth's pretty graphic and a slew of others. But I thought this was pretty interesting and I like the backstory, how it was made and all that kind of stuff as well. And I like the, the idea of using incorporating cicadas because they're unique and strange and different. Um, extras behind the scenes of The Sound of Summer, Tokyo Talk Show with the creators of The Sound of Summer, Loud and Legendary Directors Shozuke Fudaki, and Japanese Premiere and Director and Cast. There we go for the Director and Cast. So check out The Sound of Summer. It should be out shortly by Honor Films. All right, guys, let's get into those 1981 movies. <laughs> Woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell, because through that gateway, evil will invade the world.
a curse that'll live on and on And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago In this little town when the 14th comes round There's a silence and fear in the air Remember the morn that the legend was born All the shock and the horror was there Or oh, the legend they say on a Valentine's Day Is a curse that'll live on and on And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago And no one will know as the years come and go Of the horror from long time ago Okay, first one up from 1981 is, of course, The Lovely Bloody Moon from Severn Films. Um, if you guys have never seen Bloody Moon, yes, it's a Just Franco movie. Yes, it made the video nasties list. And yes, it's a very approachable Just Franco movie. Now, Just Franco made all sorts of movies. Of course, he, he dabbled in the cannibal films, which weren't really his favorite genre. He's made erotic thrillers, erotic kind of comedies, whatever. Just Franco's made every kind of horror movie under the sun and all sorts of other different movies. Now, Bloody Moon obviously doesn't look like something Just Franco would really want to do because it's more on the gory side and he's not really one to do a lot of gore. But in 1981, the times were calling for a lot of extreme gore. And Just Franco's going to give what he's been paid to do. So, Bloody Moon uh, has a weird story, kind of like incest stuff going on here um, we have a brother and sister a brother of which who's gotten some trouble because a horrible act he cr uh, did when he was younger he scarred up uh, burnt and then we have a sister who constantly is sucking up to this paraplegic uh, aunt that kind of runs this whole college campus and owns all these things and obviously is going to give the big inheritance to her son that she loves. Um, meanwhile, we kind of follow around a group of girls in a typical kind of slasher fashion. We mostly focus on one, um, really. And, and um, I got to say that all this girl's sweaters, all these girls' sweaters are absolutely ridiculous and very 80s and very hilarious. Um, the score in here is, is really good, although they use kind of one track uh, many times. It, it's a very memorable score and it stands out, that track. It's really good. If you've probably heard it, if you've ever seen the trailer. And being 1981, we, the year before, I mean, 79, we had the zombie showstopper. 80, we had the City of Living Dead showstopper. All these kind of showstopping scenes. So Jess Franco, probably maybe producer orders, or he had a good idea. Um, they told him, you need the showstopper in this one. Now, although it is a bit ridiculous how it unfolds, it is pretty still amazing that somebody gets kind of their head chopped off by a, uh, like a giant saw, uh, a table saw, if you will, a ro rolling table saw and it's just absolutely ridiculous insane uh, scene uh, there's a lot of bizarre characters like the girls act so strange like about getting laid or trying to get laid or faking getting laid so it's just like a bizarre kind of charming uh, uh, Spanish uh, slasher kind of jealousy I would say slasher although there is definitely a mystery behind it it definitely falls more in line with slasher it's shot in a beautiful location like I said it's got gorgeous people there's plenty of nudity because hey it's a Jess Franco movie why not there's dance sequences I mean for 81 I think I think this is a pretty solid movie and for Jess Franco it's a good one. I've always liked Bloody Moon. This is a rewatch and yeah, I enjoy it. Good stuff. Okay, the next one up again from 1981, and this is from my boy Joe D'Amato, Joey D. This is Absurd, aka Horrible, aka Monster Hunter, aka Anthropophagus 2. That's right, aka the Grim Reaper 2. Now this is a semi-sequel to the 1980 film Anthropophagus, which I love. Um, and this one is almost as good as Anthropophagus, to be honest. I enjoy this one. Now this is definitely in line with Halloween. That's right. It's definitely uh, Monster Hunter. The title is definitely like more of a horror kind of... that. that uh, VHS was also a classic VHS. Definitely more what they're trying to go for in their advertising target here. This is again a slasher. Has some familiar faces in here. Ani Bell is in here from House on the Edge of the Park. Um, you'll see Michele Suave pop up in here. I'm trying to think of some of the bigger people that star in the film. George E. Smith. Of course, kind of repraising his role. Um, Edwin uh, Perdum, who pops up in a lot of sleazy movies, including Pieces and Don't Open Till Christmas. So he pops up in here, and he's basically the Loomis character. In the very beginning of the film, he's this uh, Greek priest, and he's chasing down this guy uh, in Eastman. And Eastman tries to hop this fence, and he ends up disemboweling himself. 
sound familiar? So he ends up running into this house, um, and he kind of oh, he doesn't even get in the house. He kind of passes out in the in the street. They take him to the hospital, and the doctors, to their uh, chagrin, he starts to heal much quicker than he should in his procedure and everything. And before not, he's out and about killing anyone he comes in contact with in ridiculous ways and extremely gory ways too. And George Eastman's like six nine, so he's just like picking up people and, and killing them. And of course, you guys know it's the Super Bowl happening right now, and trying to be very Americanized, they're having spaghetti at the Super Bowl, yada, yada, yada. It's absolutely ridiculous. Everybody's ever seen this movie has to mention them eating spaghetti at the Super Bowl, right? Um, and just the dialogue over the narr- you know, the commentary for the football is absolutely ridiculous and silly. Um, so anyways... It's just that they're talking about the Super Bowl is such an Americanic, American thing, and then they're like eating spaghetti while watching. It's just fucking hilarious. So uh, Edwin Perdue is basically the Loomis of the movie, right? He's this Greek priest running to find him and bring him back to justice. Um, but it's not going to happen before George Eastman disembowels most of the entire cast and kills all of them. And of course, he has his eyes focused on where Annie Bell is. She's, uh, I believe, a babysitter, or Annie Bell's the older sister. No, she's a nurse that's going to check on this uh, quadriplegic girl, temporary quadriplegic. She has injuries to her neck, and she's going to have to relearn to walk and everything, and the family's been waiting for her. You know, it's a family of four, uh, young young boy, uh, young teenage daughter, and then the couple are out watching the Super Bowl. And then we have, of course, the, the babysitter and the, the nurse who show up. Now, the people that get really destroyed here is Annie Bell. It's, it's pretty rough stuff. I mean, and like, again, like I said, it's 1981, so everybody's looking for that big show stopper, show stopper kill, and, and there's a couple in here for sure. Um, there's one guy who always plays a stuntman that George Eastman walks in like this butcher shop and the dude literally like dodges like a butcher knife from him, grabs a gun and shoots Eastman. You're like, that guy should have lived. Like that guy had every, like in, in normal circumstances, if something pops up, that dude was down too bad. Like George Eastman is like a mutant. and can grow back like everything. He's like a low rent Wolverine, but his brain scrambled because he goes crazier and crazier. So as far as the special features, we have Rosso Sangu, alternate Italian cut with optional English subtitles, the return of the Grim Reaper interview with actor, writer, co-producer Luigi Montefiori, that's George Eastman, the Adato on video, archive interview with director Anastasis Mascaccesis, a biker, uncredited interview with filmmaker extra Michele Soave. So yeah, this is a fun one with a high body count, a good score. Um, I will say though that I there's this, this Blu-ray has always been really fishy in my main player and I always have to switch it out, although it plays fine in there. I don't know what the issue is. That's absurd. Okay, the next one up is a certified classic from 1981, one of my personal favorite movies uh, from 81, and this is Butcher, Baker, Nightmare Maker, a.k.a. Night Warning. And this one, uh, this is a movie that grew a, a cult following because it has a, a kind of gay stuff in there, a gay subtext or a gay storyline or whatever. Um, but it also had a following because it was a slasher movie made in the 80s or slasher-esque, and it was really hard to find for years. It was never released on DVD. The VHS Night Warning went for a lot of money. But then eventually Code Red put a DVD out and then they upgraded to blu-ray and then kino picked it up and put a slip cover on it so it's had many releases now thankfully and yeah this is butcher baker nightmare maker starring jimmy nickel and of course susan tyrell now susan tyrell is a showstopper the year before she's in forbidden zone by richard elfman and she's been in a bunch of movies um andy warhol's bad fat city she's got a really big cult following for good reason you know susan tyrell is one of these characters that somehow goes completely over the top completely dangerous you don't have any idea what the fuck she's doing but it all comes comes together and just works brilliantly now this movie starts off with a really wicked car accident and we learn that this boy's parents died he's going to have to be raised by his aunt um, who he basically learns to call mother that's played by susan terrell the young kid's jimmy mcnichol he's working on a basketball scholarship in high school he's excellent he's probably going to get it um until one day uh susan tyrell murders this tv repairman that she makes advances on and he turns her down this brings in racist and homophobic cop Bo Sevson, who's in a million movies, The Walking Tall sequels, uh, Beyond the Train Part 3. Um, what was the movie? Virus from last year, the Japanese-American co-production. So Bo Sevson is no stranger to horror films or exploitation films or, or just kind of bizarre cinema. So he comes in as this homophobic cop when he realizes that the TV repairman was homosexual and he was lovers, which is me McNichols' basketball coach. So this leads him on this kind of rabbit hole of tunnel vision. And I love that Bo Sevson's playing it like he's right. He's playing it like he's a dirty, hairy character where he's a crooked cop, but he knows he's right so he don't give
give a shit. But we all know as an audience that he's 100% wrong and he's the villain. But he doesn't know he's the villain. So I really like how he did that. Susan Tyrell and Bo Sevson have this weird kind of dynamic that's like they don't really, you know, they, they hate each other, but they say things that are similar. You know, the gay, their gays are degenerate and all this kind of shit like that. And um, they portray all the characters who are gay are as decent folk in the movie. So I like that. It also has the guy from uh, Bill Paxton makes a small appearance, an early appearance here. It's kind of like a bully. Haha, ha, very expected, you know, before Weird Science. And then um, they also have uh, the, the cop, the kind of second cop in the film is played by the guy in Great Outdoors who got struck by lightning 66 times. And he's really good in this. Now, this isn't an all-out slasher fest or a gore fest. It's a lot of psychological stuff going on. But once it picks up, you get some, like, Norman Bates shit going on and some weird kind of scandals and, and gothic incest shit, southern fried. And I think it's really good. I think that uh, the storm really adds an element to it when all the characters are being killed. It's storming in the background. I really love that. Um, and, again, the lead's solid. And the, the the one complaint is at the very end they give a scroll just so everybody's like thank god that happened because they don't really want to they wanted to play it a little safe this director was a, a big tv kind of guy but i really do think they made kind of a hidden gem here from 1981 and butcher baker nightmare maker as far as the special features are concerned they're all ported over from the dvd if i can tell but we do have a brand new 2017 2k scan from original camera negatives the vault finally found it after misplacing it for years audio commentary with writer and direct a uh, producer writer stephen bremer and co-author alan j glue in house moderated by nathaniel thompson i'm sure that's great and then we have another commentary by jimmy mcnichol then we have on-camera interviews with star jimmy mcnichol and that's just like 20 years after the initial movie he seems like a pretty chill guy susan tyrell she seems like a, a card um steven easton seems like a really great nice guy makeup artist alan alpone and producer steve bremer both seem like really good guys steve bremer's story was really interesting it was the longest interview of the bunch talked about you know working with click and house and that as well but anyways this is an absolute classic from 1981 i really recommend you guys check it out okay this next one here i do not own a copy thank god and this is night of horror boy this is considered one of the worst horror films ever made i don't really know what to tell you guys i had i'd avoided it like the plague ever since i heard about it but it was like 70 minutes and that's exactly how much time i had okay this whole movie starts off with kind of like a, a framing story where they're going to tell you the story there's two guys that tell you the entire backstory there's two guys talking and they're arguing and you can barely hear what they're saying because there's like a, a cooler running or some shit or and they're all have their backs turned to the camera they do like one angle maybe two angles the entire time it's very low budget I, it's hard to hate on a movie that was probably shot on some sort of low-grade film um, and then all that stuff but Night of Horror it literally is just a movie with a bunch of exposition and driving and then like 10 minutes of uh, Civil War reenactment and the only thing that makes that really tolerable is the music they made for that scene is actually pretty decent which made me question did they make this whole movie and that scene just for this so people could hear this song and I wouldn't be surprised Night of the Horror I wouldn't be surprised at all because what you guys are selling is not really very good so one of the characters in the RV that they're traveling with they're having an argument they're going to pick up some stuff and their father there's a dad uh, he died and they don't know him so they're all arguing and they want to get to the you know uh and, and they have this point where they're selling everything and, and one doesn't want to sell something along the line so they have this argument but one of the characters ends up being mildly psychic and realizes that there's some obviously some turmoil here because it was around the civil war and all these battles and this ghost seems to follow them around um there's a point where the ghost is there's ghost in the shadows and fog and there's like I don't know what and the sounds really bad so you really don't really know what they're saying half the time I can't really give this movie a recommend it's mostly exposition and uh, Civil War reenactment so that's Night of Horror not great not great at all <laughs> Just got back up to the Bay Area. 
okay, the Patreon pick. Um, Dan the Cameraman had that spaghetti list, but he was like, I don't remember the list, so just pick a Vinegar Syndrome you haven't seen. So I went with the Vinegar Syndrome archive, and I went with The Grave from 1995-1996. I had never really heard of this movie, and then when I saw they were releasing, I was like, that sounds really interesting. What caught my back, well, my, my eye, my back, what the hell, um, was the the line in here that says something along the lines, it's very Tales from the Chris... Chris, Crypt X. I'm sorry, guys. My throat is really dry. Very Tales from the Crypt esque. And I love Tales from the Crypt. So, um, the cast here, it opens up with a good framing story. We have Keith David talking to somebody with a real raspy voice like this in this jail. And you really don't know who it is, but you're figuring it's got to be somebody from the, the story that you're about to hear. And Keith David's in here. He's wonderful. One of my favorite actors. So, we kind of have a flashback where we're listening to the story of the grave. And this is whole wife's kind of tale, southern fried, kind of gothic stuff. And I'm like, I'm in. I'm in 110%. Yeah, I got the twangy soundtrack you got a great cast of b character actors and i'm just like i'm in so you keep david right off the bat one of my favorite actors we got to get in there and we're following craig schaefer from nightbreed frame and another actor that i think you guys would recognize so they uh are in this kind of like chain gang work swamp environment somewhere in louisiana some show right and uh he basically starts telling him there's this old man yada 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 and he got buried with all his gold and i know these kind of ways to get to it get out of here and they basically offer him some sort of protection and they sneak out they break out um the guy who tells him this is giovanni ribsy from you know saving private ryan but the guard who lets him out who is john deal from stripes and uh, a million other movies he's an actor who's just in a slew of things and he's always really good he's even in that really crummy full moon kids movie remote he's a bad guy in that but he's always solid he's a very solid actor so uh they end up getting out and running and uh, they bump into some old friends and it's played by my anthony michael hall uh, max per 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 lynch who's in a bunch of stuff and of course you know um donald logue and they eventually find out about the secret of the grave along with Craig Schaefer's girlfriend, Gabrielle Antoine from Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead. So it kind of complicates things. Along the way, they run into Ro Eric Roberts and his small little scene is brilliant. And yeah, it's kind of a just desserts kind of story going on and I really dug that. That's totally up my alley. Like I said, it feels a lot like a Tales of the Crypt episode. It's just a little longer than maybe a Tales of the Crypt, but a lot longer, but still. It doesn't really feel like it runs that long. Um, but yeah, all the characters come in at the very end and we have a, a reveal, of course, and then it ends on a nice little... Yeah, that's a good that's a good way to end this. As far as the special features are concerned, we have commentary track with writer-director Jonas Pat. A Tales from Beyond the Grave, an interview with writer-director Jonas Pat, and I like that. Or is it Pate or Pat? Uh, or Pates. Um, so, so I like that interview because he talks about this movie kind of basically not really getting any chance at all. And he talks about first-time directors kind of having these demands and stuff, and he was just like, I was very polite and all that stuff. Tales from Beyond the Grave, an interview with writer-director. All right, we did that. The bottom line, interview with actor Keith David. Gotta love that. Um, Baptism by Fire, an interview with cinematographer Frank Prizzi, all the way to the morgue, interview with effects artist Jeff Goldwyn and Rick Poor, Engraving the Score, an interview with composer Alex Werman, and then, yeah, so it's got a bunch of shit on here. Well worth your time. If you like southern kind of fried crime stories, check it out. It's not really a horror film, but it does have some gothicness to it, but that is the grave. Okay, let's get into these comments, concerns, all that jazz. Ilk Vomit, Kicha Choo. Man, that DVD takes me right back to the good old days of Suncoast Video. We could all go back, right? Asgarth. Dave, where did you get the uh, Ulevited? I've tried looking everywhere. I can't find it. Should be a message. Um, if you can't buy the DVD or rent it or something, I, I can try to help you find it. Horse Cinema. I'm sure you've answered this before, but what is the origin of that thing you do at the end of your videos with the elbow? And, hey. It was just this joke that uh, I guess I was playing like a little creature or a gizmo to my friends. And just like be like, you can't. like uh, uh, The little creature would never talk. I'd just be like, eh, like that. And then it turned into that. Mixed with uh, Poultry Geist, uh, the Jared joke from Poultry Geist, Trauma's Poultry Geist, where they see uh, Michael Hertz and he's playing. Oh, it's, I'm sorry, not Michael Hertz. They always credit him as Michael Hertz. Joe Flyshaker. And he's on the counter and he's like, he's like, don't you even think of skipping that soy gravy? And he's like leaning on there with his elbow. Like, it's like, it's Jared. You lost all the weight and you kept it off. And he's just like, that's how he cuts in. So that elbow is that. And the eh is me doing like a shitty gizmo. So it's a mixture of two things I always did. And that's just what it became. Horse Cinema. I'm sure you've answered... Oh, there we go. Nick Mua. Wolf Hour seems like an 80s gem. The 80s were a treasure trove when it comes to genre cinema. There will, like, never see again, sadly. Question. Do you ever catch the anthology film from Whisper to a Scream? Vincent Price deemed it uh, too sleazy. 
uh, did you enjoy it? Yes, I have, aka The Offspring. I remember the cover art very well. There's a poster. I have a poster of The Offspring. Um, I, I really enjoy that um, one. It's directed by Jeff Burr. It was his directorial debut of a feature length. It's great stuff. All the shorts are, all the, the stories in there are great. Um, and the best one has Clue Gulliver in it. And, and there's a good one with Cameron Mitchell, too. Um, I love the story he tells in the DVD of Jeff Burr. Uh, Cameron Mitchell, and that sounds like, boy, you are fat. He calls this one guy fat. And just like the guy, he's like, lucky he laughed it off. But man, that would have been, that was strange. So, uh, did you enjoy it? Yes, I love that movie. Have you ever been to Texas Frightmare? No, I've never set foot in Texas. Um, if so, what it's like, I do not know, but it sounds fun. Uh, who, who's better at horror, Hammer, Hammer Amicus? Um, Amicus had a lot of gems, um, but the sheer number of movies that Hammer Horror put out, you gotta go with Hammer, to be honest. And I think they probably had more money. Uh, it's hard. And Hammer did a lot of sci-fi. But, I mean, I don't know if I like any... Man, it's tough to say. Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Four, I think, are masterpieces, so it's really hard. But I would probably have to go with Hammer, just on the sheer amount and the, them coming first, with the horror films at least. Um, and then hope the weather's good, sir, to keep you up. Good through all. Don't I don't know you'll ever. I don't know exactly what all that is. Doesn't really make sense. Spelling errors. Uh, Ten Charge, Unstable Freak. There's only one JCVD, but it's cool that people want to be like him. I think it's more the producers back in the day wanted people to be like John Clyde. Ken Coakley, just chiming in on the writer's strike. Uh, in the, uh, I'm in the opinion that Hollywood needs a reset button. I'm not a Tarantino fan, but he and I agree that the current state of cinema is pretty pathetic. First off, as Tarantino put it, ideology trumps storytelling. Ideology trumps art. Ideology trumps entertainment. I would have felt the same way if it were ideology I agree with. Art is for everyone, and that includes film and music. Ideology isn't the only problem. An even bigger problem than that is the remakes and reboots. Then the, um, there's Indonesia uh, indignation of films with paper thin plots and flash cuts the Avengers movies as well as the recent Godzilla films are guilty of that I think they should take a breather and re-release older films they did that during COVID and it helped them to stay afloat the problem was they put out 80s and 90s movies that were just all the same movies how many times can I watch the same lot no shit um, I mean they put uh, should put out the first two Godfather films Easy Rider Star Wars as well as classic horror from Universal Hammer AIP they should also bring back the makeshift drive-ins like they used did during COVID you know I'm not going to disagree with you uh, Ken like a lot of that stuff you know what i mean like um i don't know how in the I, I always like question that i'm sitting there watching these movies by wes craven and john carpenter and george romero and i'm like they're getting their messages in and they're they're just like telling these amazing stories and and the way they tell their stories like they get people to pay attention to their messages even Ruggiero diodato hit you over the head with his message in cannibal holocaust but the way it was done the storytelling the framing of the story was interesting enough to keep your attention if it comes across like a joke or just so ham-fisted People laugh. And it, it reminds me of the don't be a menace while drinking your juice in South Central joke. Every time something like that happens, Keenan Ivory Wentz walks out and says, message, and looks right at the camera and hands somebody a letter. And it's just a very funny gag because some things are so ham-fisted, they're embarrassing. You know what I mean? You can hit somebody over the head with it and not come across like you're being ham-fisted. And I agree. I don't care like if I agree with it or disagree with it. You know, It just can become cringe if you're just not doing it right. You need finesse. If you don't have finesse, you know, it's stupid. It's like, and I'll use this as an example. I don't want to be rude, but there was one from last year. Jeez, I cannot remember. Uh, Run, Sweetheart, Run. That was the most ham-fisted crap I've seen in a long time. Well-made, well-directed, well-acted. Screenwriter. Or the director, somebody just did not know how to finesse shit. And, and then also, um, Train to Busan, the animated movie that came before, um, uh, Soul Station. Ham fisted crap. Like, I'm sorry. Just because it's just message is crap. Like Romero, like I said, and these guys, they could just get their messages in there and be perfect about it. And even if they were hitting you over the head with it, it never felt like crap. Scott Helm. Dave, have you read the original Ghost Story novel? It's the scariest book I've ever read. I try to revisit it every few years as it reveals new bits and scares, similar to Salem's Lot, and its careful telling of town's residents and horrible things that slowly happen to them. Love the movie, too, but the book is a masterpiece. No, I wanted to... Is that a Peter Straub? Like, I'm interested in the book, for sure, um, but I really do like the movie now, so I, I maybe I will read the book. It's been a long time since I've read anything. I never have quite the time I used to, but uh, yeah, I guess we're out of here, guys. No update. I do have an order for Screen Factory coming, and I do have vinegar syndrome order coming i can't fight the mail system right eh thank you guys very much for watching and as always have a good one eh.